Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Six Figure Certified Coach, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Chapman, and of course, I'm here with Katie DePaula Silverman. Katie DePaula Silverman. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. You're really using your good girl voice today. I am a good girl. It's almost Christmas. I want to be on the nice list. I went to a Christmas party last night and they had like chocolate coal, like it was wrapped. Clever. And it like looked, it like looks like coal. Did That's you- what my husband will be getting this year. I was going to say, did you get that? But. No, but I'm going to give it to someone else. Well, whatever it takes. At least they can eat it. At least it's chocolate. Right. So it's like not really cold because it's like chocolate coal. An actual gift. Right. All right. Well, do you want to introduce our topic or do you want me to? Uh, I mean, it's kind of on brand with naughty or nice, really. But yeah, Ooh. go ahead. So today we're talking about inspiration versus discipline and really this whole idea that you have to be inspired to create. I should really say like this lie or this myth that you have to be inspired to create. And I think this is a really juicy topic, but also discipline gets like some hate, like it's boring. I don't want to be disciplined. And like you like to say, discipline is not a dirty word. I know. I actually hate rules. You know I do. I'm so bad at following. When I like when I hear one, it like just makes me not want to follow it, kind of. So, you like people to follow your rules, though. Let's be real. Well, you know, somebody's got to make the rules. And yeah, yeah. I like people to do things my way. That's true. Olivia likes to make the rules and then turn around and break the rules. But Yeah. Well, that's like where we're kind of going with this conversation today, though. First of all, I do feel like you said it right. It's like a myth or something fake. Like, I feel like there's all of these people in the entrepreneur space, especially in this like feminine business building thing and not no hate. Business building thing. Everyone likes to do things differently, but I just don't think it's possible to just always be like floating and living off inspiration if you want to run a business. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think that that is a bonus that you, and and something you get to experience some of the time, but I don't think it's realistic to expect that every day you're just so inspired, you're feeling so wonderful, and you're operating from this place of like feminine bliss or whatever you want to call it. I'm like, I actually feel like I operate in that more when I've like already done the like disciplined actions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because like one of the things I'm talking about that's really, really present for me, one of the things I'm thinking about that's really present for me as you're talking is like so much of my life has been based upon creating from pain. And so in a way you could say like, pain has been my inspiration, like pain or challenges in life have been my inspiration. But I don't think that most people look at inspiration, look at pain or challenge or difficulty or loss as something that you can draw inspiration from. So I think this is a really wide conversation that we can have both in the fact that you don't always have to be inspired, quote unquote, but also that we can define inspiration really broadly. And yeah. maybe some of the things that we don't consider inspiration actually are inspiration and vice versa. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think that a lot of people, you know, inspiration or motivation, I do feel like to a degree those could be used interchangeably here. I do th- think that pain and things that happen to you in your life can be the catalyst for you taking action. However, mm-hmm. There are going to be days when you don't feel like it. Like I'll never Mm -hmm. forget sitting in the Hay House Writers Workshop and people in the audience all are aspiring authors. And they're like, I just can't get my book done because I need to be like in a cabin in the mountains where I'm inspired and I just need to sit there for a week and write it. And I remember the person on the stage and I'm I'm sorry, I can't remember who it even was that was speaking at this point because this was like five years ago, but 
She was like, you don't need to be in a cabin in the woods to write. You need a pen and paper or a computer and you need to stick to your writing schedule. And I was like, oh, like it's such a basic concept. Yeah. It's like, I mean, you've written a whole book or are almost done with a second. So, I mean, you could probably speak even more to this, but if you only wrote when you were inspired, you'd probably still be writing that book. Yeah. I also think that like, um, discipline and practice is what makes space for inspiration to come. Right. So I took a class, I think it was in February. It was like eight weeks or something, but it started in February of this year and it was about novel writing. And the woman who taught the class is an author and she's written many books. And she basically was like, the practice is simple. She's like, write for 90 minutes a day. You get one day off a week and you can do it whenever you feel inspired. I recommend first thing in the morning because your consciousness has not fully come online. And so it won't get in the way as much. And a lot can come from that like semi dream state. Right. Mm -hmm. So I probably wrote five days a week for an hour. And I I did. I wrote the first draft of a novel in, in, I think it was four months or something like that. It was really fast, actually. And then you get into like editing and, and things like that, which is a different process. But she was very much like about the disciplined practice. And, you know, I agree with you. And like, sometimes when you sit down and write, you're writing complete shit. Other times, like it's half shit, half gold. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, yeah, you have an idea the night before and you can like write your way into it. Right. But I think writing is a great example because it's something that so many of us love and, and do whether we have a journaling practice or, a you know, we're working on a book or something like that, whether we're writing content for our businesses, but writing is a great, lens to have this conversation through because so many of us rely on writing in our work. It could also be just like emails or doing payroll or right. Like these are just things that you have a, you develop a discipline around. And then you and I were talking about this the other day. We were like, we used to hate doing payroll, but now we love it because it makes us feel so organized. We understand where all the money's going, like who we're investing in it. And so now I draw inspiration from something that I used to dread And I do think that some of that is just getting really familiar being in process and being comfortable being in process. So many of us are just committed to the end result. Like we just want to have the task done, the email at inbox zero, the book written. But actually the part of it that's the most juicy and, you know, has the most meat and interest is the process part of it. Yeah. But we kill the process trying to get to the end result. Yeah. And I do, I mean, the process, yes, I agree with that. But I also think like that feeling you get when things are done that you were kind of dreading or, you know, commitment yeah. to yourself. I I know I've always done this. I've, I've always been a morning person. I like to do all the like shit I don't really like first thing in the morning and get it out of the way so I can kind of fall more into that. Like, Hmm, what do I feel like doing this afternoon? Do I feel like writing the email? Like I take the pressure deadline or dread things out of the way first thing in the morning. And then I feel like I have that more of like flow or inspired, inspired work in the afternoon. Not every, you start with discipline. Yeah. I start with discipline. That's the thing. I have to though too. And I do feel like, and I've said this in many episodes, having kids really, really, and, uh, influenced that and how I work. So one thing I've heard you say, Liv, is that your issue with inspiration is that it's not reliable. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I think anyone who's listening to this has been thrown off when they like set out to have a perfect day. Case in point, like basically every day as a mother, like I'm going to have this amazing work day today. I'm going to do this interview. I'm going to do this. School calls, they're sick or they're throwing up in the middle. You know what I mean? Like things are always happening. And I do think that even just the state of the world is one of those. I have been very distracted lately by things going on in the news. I know you know, there's certain things that'll throw everyone's day off. God forbid a school shooting or like something catastrophic in the world. Politics, like whatever. Yeah. Any of it. And there have been days where I have 
wanted to check out because I felt, you know, impacted by things. But mm-hmm. truth be told, when it, for me, I still get most things, if not everything done that needs to be done from my like disciplined list, if you mm-hmm. will, like non-negotiables, because mm-hmm. I actually want to be able to create space to you know, feel or exist or just be, or like have downtime. And if I'm in my downtime worried about the shit that I didn't do earlier, I'm not actually able to fully relax. And that's why I think, you know, this thing that I've said, and I actually said it in so many calls that one of our students sent me a thank you card and said, I'll never forget uh, that being more disciplined helps me be more free. And I think that often I feel so much more free when I've been disciplined in terms of the things that I declare need to be done, the non-negotiables, the no matter what type of commitments. And the nice thing, I know we were talking about like, I hate following rules, but I like following my own or whatever. When you're in business for yourself, and I think, you know, the, the conversation we're having is discipline versus inspiration, but we're really talking about like, what's more important as a business owner, as a coach. And ultimately, you know, being disciplined is much more reliable than hoping that I feel inspired every day and, you know, or waiting for that inspiration to come. Yeah. I was listening to this podcast the other day with Elizabeth Gilbert. And, um, you know, for those of you guys who don't know, she like obviously wrote You Pray Love and a bunch of other books, but she the person that was interviewing her was like, I forget what they asked, but they were like, you know, what's your writing process like? And she was, Elizabeth, Liz was saying like, people ask me like, what kind of pen do you use? Like, do you like, they they ask, like people are looking for this like magic thing, right? Because, because she's a successful writer, she must have some secret tool that all of us who feel that we're writers don't have right? Or haven't figured out yet. Because blank is a successful business person, they must have some secret that the rest of us don't have. And she's just like, so matter of fact about it. She's like, no, I, you know, I, she basically says like, she never saw it. She always had jobs. Like even when Eat, Pray, Love got picked up and, you know, started to go get bigger and bigger. She's like, I still had my phone number and my address on my website because I was like trying to get work, you know, like, so there was like this tipping point of she was working and working and writing was her love. It was her outlet, but she had a million different jobs and odd jobs that she didn't have a career as a writer. And she just had a a love for writing. And, you know, she says, I've written everywhere. Like I've written everywhere. Right. And I feel like I've, I talk about this in my book, but like, I've written and I've written, you know, business curriculum, you know, business plans and curriculums and answered clients like from the bathtub, from the doctor's office, from like so many different places. And so I think this myth that you have to have a perfect way to work or a perfect setup or, you know, and then that's how, like once everything's kind of controlled, then the inspiration can flow in is such bullshit. And honestly, it's just doing you a disservice. Like to me, like you have to have the mindset, like, no, I can actually do this anywhere. Like my gifts work anywhere. Like they work when I have pressure. They work when I don't have pressure. They work when I have kids. They work when I don't have kids. They work if I'm in a relationship. They work if I don't, if I'm not in a relationship, they work with a glass of wine. They work completely sober. They work, they just work. Right. And also like, you're going to hit different, like, like, um, one of the big things I did when I was writing my novel was like I ch- I channeled a lot of the stress and anxiety I was having during like my first year of marriage through this. And like Adam and I would get into a fight and I would somehow like rewrite it and rework it into the book. And it was like an outlet for me, right? So it doesn't matter if like my husband and I just got in a fight or if we're getting along. Or And I think we all have these stories that whatever we want to create, let's say the creation is a business that everything else in your life has to be lined up and working for that thing to work because it's this precious thing. Yeah. But that's like saying, you know, in order to have a baby, you have to have that perfect relationship and you have to, you know, be completely settled in a house and you have to like have all the finances that you're going to need for their 18 years while they're under your care. And like, 
it doesn't work like that. You know, so much of it. Someone that today I was like, you don't need to have the entire 18 years of the baby's life planned. Like, yeah, baby, they're just more like the only thing you really need to give them is like your, you being okay and like happy or content or fulfilled and like giving them love. I was like, you don't need to think that far. I mean, financial planners would tell me I'm crazy, but like I've done this twice. So I know. (laughs) Well, and also like discipline, discipline, like relying on what you do know, right? Relying on, okay, I'm going to feed my children. I'm going to put them to bed. I'm going to give them a routine. And then, you know, we're going to figure the rest of it out as it comes. You cannot plan for like you cannot plan for the details of life. You cannot plan for the ups and downs of business. You cannot plan for the emotional journey of writing a book or creating whatever you want to create. Yeah. And that's the whole but, thing. It's emotion versus action though. Like inspiration is a feeling. Discipline is an action. So they're both great, but I do think overall that discipline is much more reliable if you want to move your life forward or your yeah. business forward. You just I mean, said um relationship like you, what? Even inside of a relationship if you want the relationship to move forward like you both have to decide like what the rules of engagement are or what the, Ooh, the rules of engagement is and be able to move it forward like that. Like if if every relationship just you know, only went off like feeling inspired or any type of feeling, the relationship would not succeed. Mm. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> like leaving you well, today. Hey, <laughs> what? I was like, I feel like leaving you today. I'm feeling inspired to be with someone else like or whatever. Well, okay. But let's talk about like, you just brought up the word commitment, right? So yeah. Commitment's a really great word here. We use commitment a lot when we talk about relationships, specifically long-term relationships yeah, and typically romantic relationships. But really commitment belongs in any relationship that you have with a person or with your work or with your creative practice or, um, you know, with your body, like with your body, with right, like with anything. Right. And so that's another great question to ask yourself. Like, what are you committed to and choosing from your commitments? So in coaching, we talk about being aware of your commitments. What are you committed to? You know, I'm committed to myself and my wellness. I'm committed to the success of my business. I'm committed to my spiritual practice. I'm committed to my creativity. I'm creative committed to my family and my partnership. Mm -hmm. And you start to line these things up. Right. And then you choose from your commitments. Like, so it's basically like, if I, if I know that I'm committed to these things, then what would I choose? Yeah. And if you hate the word discipline, if you think discipline's a dirty word, then also just go with commitments. I I do think they are interchangeable in a sense. Like what are your top commitments in your life, in your business, in your relationship? And do you actually put those above how you're feeling day to day. I think that discipline is a way that you show commitment. Yeah. Yeah. You also said a couple of minutes ago, you were like, discipline is an action. I agree that like, I think there's like two types of discipline that we're talking about here, like daily discipline, which does usually include actions. But then I think it's worth talking about mental discipline. Mm, Yeah. And like really training your brain to not wander too far outside of the realm of commitment. Now the, the, the non-starter, the non-negotiable here is like, you have to actually love your commitments. Yeah. So we're not saying like, okay, you're chained to a job that you hate. You're committed because you have to be financially like, that's not what we're talking about. Maybe you're committed to your family and you're committed to creating a a stable home environment and therefore you're choosing to do a job that you're not in love with, but that meets certain needs. That's a different way to look at the same thing. And it's important to consider how we look at these different things that we're choosing. Like we're not victims. No, we're not victims of our own commitments. And I do think what you're saying is like, we can almost like talk ourselves into or out of anything. What we're, yeah. what we're really discussing is like avoiding excuses mm. and taking action despite 
the wandering mind or the constant state of, you know, different feelings. I was listening to a podcast the other day where the woman was talking all about like, you know, certain times in her cycle and how she feels this and she can't work until that. And like, there's validity to some of that. I'm right. not going to downplay that. There's certain days where, you know, you might not feel your best, but I do think there's certain commitments when it comes to business that if you actually want to be successful, you have to stop using every, you know, excuse or bad feeling or this got wrench that's thrown into the schedule as a reason not to do stuff. Yeah. I know it's a little so tough. You don't believe there. in taking off when you have your period. Is that what you're saying? No, nah, that's some bullshit. <laughs> well, some people do that though, right? I like know. some people. And maybe that works for them, but I, no, that's a no for me. Yeah. But I also do take a lot of time off. It's not like I'm like chained to the computer and no, have no social life or don't see my children. I I just feel that it's more valuable to be consistent and know, you know, what to expect of yourself and be able to rely on yourself. That's what it comes down to. You have to be able to rely on yourself. If the biggest turnoff, I mean, I'm not even talking about dating. I'm talking about like life or people in general mm -hmm. for me is people who don't do what they say that they're going to do. Like major yeah. red flag, major no, hard no, walking away, can't hire you, can't work with you, can't be in a relationship with you. I, It doesn't make sense to me, Like it, especially when it has nothing to do with me. Like If you come and say, I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and none of what you do affects me, right? But yeah. if you come back and say, I didn't do any of it, I'm just like, ew. How did you not keep a promise to yourself? I know that's yeah. intense, but. Well, no, I completely agree with you. I mean, I think this is, you know, one of many areas where you and I really see eye to eye, but I think, so I'll pull from my own experience, like, you know, like just with like the period thing, not like about my period, but when people say, talk about not working during different times of their cycle, it's very hard for me to comprehend because I spent a decade of my life being very, very chronically sick and probably like three to five years of those three to five of those years being very sick, like bedridden or in treatment every week or things of that nature. And so if I didn't work for all of those years, I wouldn't have built anything during that time. And I would have missed a lot of really valuable years. And for me to think to myself that I'm incapable because I'm quote sick or I like that to me is disempowering. Yeah. So for me, the question always became, what can I do? Like yeah. if I had just gotten back from treatment or, you know, I was having a bad reaction from the medications I was on, or I had to figure a way to work with what I had. And that's really what my coaching career was born out of was that I could coach from home. I could work from home. I could coach from my bed or from the couch if I needed to. I was over the phone. You know, everything was over the phone. I just had to show up and be professional and be present. And it didn't matter where I was working from. And I had a lot of success with that, you know, and no one knew like you were my client at the time back. This is like now 10 years ago, yeah. but no one knew because it didn't matter where I was doing my work from. I was doing high level work and I was getting it done. And I was treating my clients the way they needed to be treated. How? Had I taken all that time to, off? How are you able to like, this is what people are going to say. Like what? Like, why you? Why were you able to do that when many other people are facing physical ailments or illness or distractions? Like, what do you think? Not that you have that other people don't, but like, what did you rely on to pull you up rather than bring you down? Yeah. I mean, I think like some of it was stubbornness, like just like I have to succeed. Some of it was like pressure. I was very um, focused on like succeeding outside of our, my family's business, like and yeah. p paving my own way. I was very focused on um, proving that I could get paid for work that I loved and really enjoyed. I was really focused on 
making my own way in my career. So those things really drove me. So then when setbacks came, I just had to have this mindset of resilience and okay, but how can I, or what can I do? Or I can't do that today. Right. Like, you know, some people, when I went through coach training 10 years ago, I remember some of my colleagues were like meeting with their clients in person. And I was like, okay, that's something that maybe I'll do at some point, but I can't set my business up that, that, that to have it rely on that because my body can't necessarily do that. Right. So we sometimes I'll compare like my years of being sick to like your years of pregnancy, you know, and cause there's things that perhaps you, you know, you can't do when you're pregnant or when you're trying to get pregnant that you can do at other times. And you know, people yeah. say, at least I have my health. It was like, well, what if you don't have your health? You can still thrive. You just have to find a way. Yeah. And it, it comes down to, it's such a basic concept that's so overdone in our industry and like every industry, but I really think it comes down to having such a clear outline of what your purpose is and such yeah. a rooted connection to it Yeah, that it, it does pull you out of the depths of darkness and it does get you up in the morning or at night or whatever it does. It keeps you going. And I realized the other week that I had actually lost sight of like what we were doing and like what our purpose was. And I remember sitting down and saying, it's shifted a little bit in context, but it's still fundamentally the same as it's always been. But I had to go back to that because I do think when you're getting in the nitty gritty of business or life or your, you know, disciplined actions or commitments, sometimes you can be like, this is boring. This sucks. Like I hate doing this or I don't feel like it today. But when you see what, that it actually does bring you closer, it does bring you, you know, feeling better and more connected to your purpose. I think it, it just, well, also you. like you, you brought up like the relationship and it, uh, analogy earlier. And it's like, you know, in, in a long-term relationship, like it's not going to be all peaks. There's going to be some valleys and then perhaps even worse than the valleys, there's going to be like some just flat times, right? Where it's like, okay, there's love here. There's commitment here. But like you hear a lot of people talk about periods where they feel like their partner is like their roommate, right? And it's like, how do you re-engage the love? And like when you're at the beginning of a relationship or you're falling in love or things are really good, you're like, that'll never be me. And then you're like, oh shit, I'm there, you know, or whatever. Or maybe you're hitting more, more valleys and, and things are challenged right now. But I think like the, the times in between the peaks in business and in relationships are the most important because Mm -hmm. they're really what get you to the next peak. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't cherish and honor and respect the times that are just based on commitment, that are just based on showing up, that are just based on the discipline and the, because I said I would, and the, because I, I, one of my values is showing up because I value following through, right? If, if you don't honor that and treat that as just as important and exciting as the highs and the peaks and like the trips and the wins and the record months and the wild sex and you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Then you're not ever going to get the reward consistently. And so I think that a lot of what? Yeah. It's like the whole feast and famine thing in business. Like you do everything you're supposed to do. You get all these wins. And then it's like, you forget to go back and do all of the things that you're supposed to do. Right. Recreate that again and again. And you know, you and I both sometimes get bored when we're like not in enrollment season. We're like, but I think like, bored, depressed, like Olivia, we used to get like super like, oh, fucking depressed. Like enjoy, this is when we should be going on a few vacations. Like, oh, this is when we should enjoy the downtime. And it does. Um, it's like that. It is kind of like the lull in the relationship or the I'm getting bored. Like it's time to, but, but it's, have- I don't look at it like that. Like, I think if anything, my husband and I are more like up and down and up and down. Like there's not a lot of like medium going on, but like as a marriage counselor. <laughs> right. But you know, we're kind of like that, right? Like I married a Scorpio. I have a lot of Scorpio on my chart, whatever. Of course I'm a Libra. So I'm trying to balance this whole crazy thing out. 
not working well. You're also a Leo. Lots of fire going on. Um, I'm just burning. No. Uh, <laughs> but I think that like, I will use, use the word lull, which I think is a like kind of a negative word. Mm, yeah, you, it is a little, but that's because I know, like, prefer woo. Right. But you're also really good at discipline and consistency and showing up, at least in business. No. Maybe this is an edge in relationship, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good partner in relationships. Yeah, but I do think that you've been I like to create a little chaos to keep it spicy. Maybe we should edit this part out. Maybe we should keep this part. <laughs> but I guess the the point is like you can't expect it all to be crazy exciting all the time. Like mm-hmm. I I I feel like I've been trying to tell Adam this, but like so much of the joy of life is just in the everyday. Yeah. You know, part. you Yeah, and like to me, just feeling grounded and knowing what I'm dealing with is like so beautiful and it feels so full to me. But in the past, I will say that, you know, the ups and the downs were really where I got my inspiration from. Mm -hmm. And when I kind when I finally recovered from the Lyme and treatment and the loss of my brother and the broken engagement and all those things that happened back to back. And then Adam and I got together. Business was consistent. You and I were in a really good place. Like everything felt really solid. I I really started to live with this prayer of like, teach me how to be happy here. Mm -hmm. Like teach me how to be happy, like God, universe, life, whatever. Like teach me how to be happy in the consistency of life and in the discipline of life and in the ritual and in, you know, I think of like the word practice and commitment and, you know, these are not negative things. Like these are beautiful things. They're not boring. Like to me, they're so necessary. Like they're, you know, they're, they're the groundwork of all of it. And then whatever you build on top is so much more beautiful and can soar to such greater heights because you have this foundation. Yeah. Well, you're really saying is there's beauty in the, in the present, in the journey. And you can also draw inspiration from wherever you're at, despite circumstances. And what I'm really hearing is that it's almost like we need to stop the chase too and find this mm. balance of being good where we're at, knowing that also being good where we're at creates the next you know, peak, as you called it. I think anyone with an entrepreneurial spirit Mm -hmm. feels this sense of chase. We feel it in the off season of coach training. We feel it in life when things aren't moving fast enough. And I do Mm -hmm. agree that we have come a long way in this, Mm -hmm. meaning the most valuable thing to me, as much as I like a little spice is actually like 90% to have the most peaceful life ever. I mean, we just want to have like a reality show. Now I'm like, how rich do I have to be to to delete social media forever? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, (laughs) I just wanted things to be quiet and calm. And like my vision board is like a house in the middle of nowhere, you know, whereas it used to be much different. But it's enjoying, if we can enjoy the commitments on a day-to-day basis, we're still going to be moving ourselves forward towards the bigger, exciting milestones. Yeah. I remember what you just said makes me think of this, but I remember I read this, this thing that Tim Ferriss wrote, who, who was, is the author of the four hour work week and which is complete bullshit. He never worked four hours in a week. Um, Oh my God. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, I thought so. Yeah. Um, you're not really working. That's what they say. Right, 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 right. (laughs) But anyways, you know, he, he's very intelligent and very successful and has, has, you know, acquired a lot of fame and wealth. And, um, he was talking about being famous and being wealthy and which Mm -hmm. he would choose. And 
his argument was like so strongly like if I would choose either of these things at all, it would be wealth. But the fame is like kind of trash <laughs> because it just demands so much of you. And, you know, there's this myth of like, if I become famous and like every, everything will be handled where in fact, you know, perhaps the demands of life become unmanageable or to, or to quote Taylor Swift, um, the problem is me. <laughs> Irrelevant. So Liv, you, um, have some tips and some tools yeah, for staying give, disciplined. We need to give some tips. Cause I know we talked through a lot of this, but I don't like when things aren't clear. The gray area is my worst enemy. So we're going to clear this up, put a little ribbon on it. So you have something to walk away with, but and you can add to this, Katie, too. But oh, top- thank you. That's very nice. Well, I know I like kind of wrote them because I was like thinking of all the ideas, and then I was like, oh my gosh, we need to like give clear, actionable steps because we were so intense with this topic. So I can't just leave you feeling like we yelled at you all day. But top tips: number one, you have to really get clear on what your you know rules, disciplines, commitments are. You have to mm-hmm. figure out what those things are. I was talking to someone from our program who graduated a few years ago. She ended up working in corporate. Now she's full-time in her business. And she's like, I just feel like I don't know what to do every day. And I was like, write out your, you know, five to 10 daily or weekly commitments, your non-negotiables, things that it doesn't matter what's going on. They're going to get done every week that move your business forward. So Mm -hmm. write those down, whether it's posting five times on social media, following up with 20 leads, writing an email to your list, putting your you know business cards in a new location. What are you actually committed to every day? Or I do think when it comes to business, it might be weekly. So write those down, get mm-hmm. super clear on what they are. I think I did these a little bit out of order, but number two, which really should be number one, get clear on what your purpose is. You have to know why you're doing what you're doing. You have mm-hmm. to be rooted in that. And mm-hmm. I would say that maybe one of your commitments is actually just going back to either you know, your vision board or your written out purpose. It doesn't have to be anything lengthy. One of these uh, women I've been following lately says, you know, write, do a 30 second recording of your purpose, listen back to it first thing every morning. If something like that would help you just keep you grounded, to keep you rooted, go Mm -hmm. for it, but know what it is. I remember, just like I said, a month ago, I I had, I couldn't even remember. Like I knew bits and pieces of it, but it helped. I didn't know this was going on for you. You didn't even talk to me about it it out pretty quickly. So (laughs) (laughs) cause I was like, what the fuck is going on? Let me get this. Dude, it happens though. But it's also shifted too. It's like the core of it was the same, but how I live it has shifted. I know, but this is what I was telling you. Remember when I had a meltdown at the leaders rising retreat in LA, which one? (laughs) And I was like, I, I realized that like my original motivation for starting IGC was no longer a thing. So then I had to find a new motivation for it. Like my original motivation for those who didn't get to see me ugly crying in front of our students was, yeah, that was such a nice moment though. Come to leaders rising retreat. If you're listening to this. Yeah. Well, my original motivation was like, and this like sounds so sad to say out loud, but it was really real for me. And I know it's real for other people. Like I, I truly didn't know if I was going to have the family life that I desired for myself. And I, meaning like a partner and children, and I'm still working on some of this. But what happened was I built this whole company that fed a lot of the needs that I originally when I was probably, you know, 16 years old, thought I would have gotten from a partner. And so IGC gave me like all of this love and all of this meaning. And then that was where I derived it all from, but it also demanded a lot of me in those categories. And so when a partner came into my life and we got engaged and we decided to get married, I sort of was having this like breakdown of, well, now what? Because I had actually created my company from this story of a void, which felt really true for me at the moment. And that that void was now becoming closed. And so I needed like 
another way to look at this beautiful thing that I had created. It wasn't a, a personal band aid. It was like my gift and my contribution back to the world. But I had to rework some things in order to see it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're listening to this and you, you know, wanted to quit your job for whatever reason, or you wanted to start your business for whatever reason, and things have changed, you, there's no problem with going back and kind of rewriting it and, you know, looking at what you need in your life right now and how what you're doing contributes to that and do it again and again. And you'll know when it feels right. You'll know when you've kind of hit that sweet spot of like, oh my God, this is the thing. Like, this is why I wake up. This is why I follow through. This is why I do what I do. So clarity on that. And then my last main thing when it comes to, you know, staying disciplined is to, you have to have accountability. And I do think that Mm -hmm. accountability, self-accountability and self-discipline is a muscle that we grow. But Mm -hmm. just like when you're getting back in the gym, you may need a little bit of support from a trainer or you may need a gym buddy first. Mm -hmm. You may need somebody, some type, you may need to go into a physical gym rather than you know, be able to work out from home, right? I've mm-hmm. still never been able to work out from home. <laughs> mm-hmm. so message me if you want to be my support buddy. But you need to find accountability or support. So you can do that in, you know, an individual. You can do that in a community. Of course, you can do that in IGC, innerglowcircle.com backslash book call and talk to one of our advisors and they'll help you mm-hmm. how to find the support that you need. But I think accountability having someone or a group of people to help you move forward as you kind of flex that muscle or grow that muscle is what's the word? It's invaluable. There's it's invaluable. Yeah. Yeah. It's invaluable. And I think that one other practice that I would recommend to people, I love your tip. So we'll do a quick review. Number one, staying connected to your purpose, knowing what your purpose is, to getting clear on your personal rules, your way of operating, what are your non-negotiables? Basically, what does discipline look like for you? Mm -hmm. And then number three, creating an accountability or support system around that discipline so that, you know, you're, you're checking off your list, the things that you need to check off to be successful every day. And we're not talking about a task list. We're talking about what do you need to operate at your optimal level? Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's so important. Another exercise I recommend that you guys go through is writing out some of these words we've been talking about and then doing some journaling on what is your relationship to these things. So what is your relationship to discipline? Like, and be really honest. Maybe you're like, discipline's bullshit. I hate discipline. It reminds me of my dad who was psycho about discipline. Or, you know, maybe it reminds you of a toxic situation. Or m- maybe that word actually triggers something really negative for you. That's mm-hmm. okay. It's just really helpful to know that because you might be resisting some of the things that we have been talking about that could be helpful because you see them as discipline and you see discipline as negative. So just getting some awareness around that. Another one is consistency. A lot of people have a really weird relationship to the word consistency and to consistency in general. I would say in some ways I'm really freaking consistent and in other ways I'm really inconsistent, right? So, but I don't hate the word consistency. I used to because with my health situation, I didn't feel like I could be consistent. And then I was like Mm -hmm. mad about consistency because it felt unattainable to me but I've realized how many ways I am consistent and how many of the, you know, the things that I do that are, are consistent that happen every week or every day. Maybe part of it looks a little different and is inconsistent, but look at that for yourself. What's your relationship to that? Then I would do it with commitment. What is your relationship to commitment? What is your relationship to practice? I think a lot of what we're talking about today is practice, right? Getting up and writing every morning is a practice. It's not a book. It's not done, right? It's practice. Getting up and working on your business every day isn't 
I made a business. It's done. It's practicing. We talk about this in coach training, working on your coaching skills, having pro bono clients, having your um, partner coach that we match you with in class. It's Mm -hmm. all practice. It's not like I coached one person. Now I'm a coach. I'm done. You're constantly in the practice of, right? And so I'm a business person, but I'm also in the practice of business. Like Mm -hmm. we say like someone, I have a law practice. Mm -hmm. Like why is it okay to call a law practice a practice, but you know, or, or, you know, a doctor like will have a, a practice, right? Why don't we realize that we're all practicing, that we're all in the exploration of, and we're improving and getting better through these things, through the consistency, through the commitment. And then the last one is ritual or routine, right? What, what is your relationship to those words? Do you love routine? Do you hate routine? I used to hate routine. I thought it was so boring. I didn't understand that like routine was actually ritual, that it could be a way of honoring, that it could be something really beautiful. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm actually having a little breakthrough as you're talking. And I'm like, I also hate the word routine. Um, I feel like I quit my job so I could do whatever I want, which is working on my business, but on our business. But I, when you said that, when you, whenever anyone says the word ritual, I get this like warm, held, grounded, almost like mother's hug kind of feeling because I think of rituals as like often in the home Mm -hmm. and that actually feels so much better than like a morning ritual to me, which Mm. I have, but I have never thought of it as a morning routine because that word just didn't resonate. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's making sense, but ritual yeah. actually feels much more comforting than routine. So maybe yeah, I- and it might feel it might feel more yeah. feminine or more intuitive, you yeah. know, or more natural, right? And yeah. so, I, I, in in my coaching practice, I've always talked a lot with clients about words, mm-hmm. and the words we use with ourselves can be really helpful or they can be great barriers to what we're trying to achieve. And so if you have, you know, a coach or someone in your life who's responsible for holding you accountable and to Liv's point, you know, they're talking about routine, 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 you're just like blacking out the whole time. Like you're just like I don't like this, I don't like this yeah. word. This is reminding me of something maybe from childhood, maybe from you know, a relationship that went sour, right? Like, so you have to find a word that actually works for you. And maybe you say to that coach, like, you know, can we actually use the word ritual? I know what you're talking about, but I would prefer if we use the word ritual, that reson, it's more resonant for me. I have a connection to that word, right? And so as we talk about this topic that can be really sticky, but is so necessary, discipline, it's not a dirty word, but if you don't like the word, choose a new word, but get the same thing done. Yeah, that was great. And I really I like that highlight on word choice because you do have to, the ultimate goal is to be able to lean into life on your own terms as an entrepreneur and build this business from your own vision. And mm-hmm. if you're letting silly things get in the way of that, like, you know, excuses or the word discipline or saying, I don't want to have a strict routine cool, don't, but find something that works for you so that you are creating a foundation to be able to bring forth everything, you know, you wish existed in the world. I love that. That's Um, so beautiful. All right. And also stay inspired. I mean, hopefully this inspired you into action. (laughs) Well, and gain inspiration from the consistency, the rituals, the, the moments, you know, I, I mean, I think like you and I have both life has forced us over the past 10 years to not chase, not, not just chase the high, right. But to be really present in the moment and to think that we can't find inspiration in an everyday moment is devastating. I mean, you know, if you read some of the most beautiful poetry or some of the, you know, most beautiful stories, like they're about such simple things, you know, they're, they're about, the moon and the stars and a cup of coffee or a warm drink and a mm-hmm. holding a hand and 
you know, and like that's what we're really here for. So find the beauty and the inspiration in the simplicity of the moment and also rely on your routine to see where those things already exist. Yeah. Yeah. And our next episode will have to be on gratitude or something because that's also what I'm hearing. So stay inspired, stay present to what you've already created. And if you know someone who needs to hear this episode, please share it with them. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast and leave us a nice review. Yeah. Thanks guys. Thanks for being on this journey with us. We love you. Thank you.